Morning all. Recall that last week we treated chapter 11 with the title British Conquest of Nigeria. In that chapter 11, we looked at different agents that helped Britain to conquer Nigeria. Today, chapter 12, we are going to look at the different administration, administration sector Britain had. Remember, Nigeria was not the only country in West Africa that Britain had as a colonial possession. There were other countries in West Africa that Britain had. So Britain, Britain created different administrations in different West African countries. And we identify terrain. Number one is the one they called crown colony. And we say that a crown colony was regarded as a British territory and was directly controlled from Britain. Crown colonies were established through military conquest, diplomatic missions, and treaties with the local people. For instance, the colony of Lagos was annexed in 1861 by John B. Croft of the British Royal Navy. British laws applied to the Crown colonies and the citizens were regarded as British subjects. The second administrative method Britain used is known as protectorate. And protectorate is seen as a territory under the control and protection of the British government. Citizens of the protectorate were classified as protected citizens and were subject to the rule of their traditional rulers who were answerable to the British authorities through the governor of the colony who also administered the protectorate by making laws for them. The third one is what is called trust territory. And you remember that Germany caused the First and Second World War. When Germany was defeated by the Allied powers, most of the German possession in Africa were taken away from her and made trust territories. And we said here that trust territories were territories under the control of Germany before the First World War of 1914 to 1918. The defeat of Germany after the war enabled the League of Nations to hand over such territories to the imperial powers that contributed to the defeat of Germany. For instance, in West Africa, Britain got Southern Cameroon, which it administered along with Nigeria and held in trust for the League of Nations, later called the United Nations Organization until the territory's independence. In administering her new Nigerian empire, the country was arbitrarily divided into three for administrative convenience, namely the colony of Lagos, the protectorate of Northern Nigeria, and the protectorate of Southern Nigeria. Each of the protectorates was ruled by a governor Sir Frederick Lugard was the first High Commissioner for the Northern Protectorate, while Sir Ralph Moore was the first British official to rule the Southern Nigerian Protectorate with its headquarters in Calabar. It should be noted that the headquarters of the Northern Protectorate was at Zungeru. In 1906, both the colony of Lagos and the Protectorate of Southern Nigeria were amalgamated and designated the Protectorate of Southern Nigeria. And Walter Egerton, who served between 1906 and 1911, became the new governor. In 1914, the Protectorate of Northern and Southern Nigeria were amalgamated under Sir Frederick Lugard. Today, we are going to look at the objective. What are we to know? What will our students know after studying this chapter 12? 
our students will be made to know or state the different categories of British colonies in West Africa. Examine the administrative setup of the protectorate. Identify the reasons for the introduction and workings of the indirect rule system. Remember, we said that in Nigeria in particular, Nigeria was divided into two administratively. Those in Lagos, that is Crown Colony, had different rules applied to them. They were regarded as British subjects. But those who were at the protectorate were not seen as British subjects. They were seen as British protected individuals. So, different rules, different administrations were introduced. Those in Lagos were ruled directly via British rule. But those at the protectorate were ruled under what is called indirect rule. And it is here that we will talk about the philosophy associated with indirect rule. And we say that indirect rule was first introduced in northern Nigeria by Lugard after 1900 to 1906. Lugard was not, however, the author of the idea of indirect rule. It has always been a power policy of the imperialists throughout history. And Lugard had seen the policy in practice during his service in India and Uganda. However, it is to Lugard that the credit for the introduction of indirect rule in Nigeria should go to. Here, we are going to ask ourselves, what is indirect rule? And there are so many people, so many scholars that have defined indirect rule in different ways. We will consider three of them. For instance, Omubiko looked at indirect rule as a system of administration under which traditional rulers were allowed to rule their people under the supervision of British officials. Oyeneye, Onyeweinu, and Olusude assert that indirect rule is a system of government whereby the British colonial administrators adapted existing political institutions of the various African peoples to suit their purpose. We see how Mwanko uh, looked at indirect rule. He looked at indirect rule by saying that it was an aspect of the British administrative system or policy aimed at ruling and administering her colonies in West Africa through the native rulers called chiefs. Why the British officials were to advise, guide, and where necessary, enforce colonial policies. In other words, the traditional rulers were used to govern their own people directly, to maintain law and order, and to collect taxes, but under the close provision, direction, and instruction of the British overlord or officials. Lugard introduced the system of indirect rule in Nigeria because of different reasons. And it is these reasons that we are going to consider. Number one was shortage of funds. Britain lacked adequate financial resources as a result of her commitment to the prosecution of First World War. She spent so much on the maintenance of her troops and equipment and was therefore not in a position to finance direct administration, which will involve posting out a large number of Britons and caring for them and machinery of governance. Secondly, there was also shortage of qualified personnel. Direct administration will involve the employment of qualified and competent personnel to administer the region effectively. Point number three, language barrier. 
direct administration of the colonies was not possible as a result of the differences in language between the local people and the colonial masters. Point number four, preservation of the traditional system. The existence of a well-organized traditional system of government paved the way for the adoption of indirect rule in the country. Number five, the large size of the territories. The region was too extensive and had no good roads or other communication means to facilitate direct administration. This again favored the adoption of indirect system of administration. Point number six is the economy. Indirect rule was very cheap to run because local people were mobilized to administer the machinery of government on behalf of the British crown. And wherever remuneration was given, it was mere pittance compared to what British nationals would have received. Point number seven, the success of the system in other countries. Lord Lugard introduced the system into Nigeria as a result of the success and acceptability it had received in India and Uganda, where it was initially introduced. Point number eight, reward for traditional rulers. The system was introduced to enable traditional rulers to maintain their control on the political areas. Remember, we've seen the reasons why indirect rule was established in Nigeria. But the successes indirect rule had in other countries like India, Uganda, and others. In Nigeria, indirect rule did not have 100% success. In Northern Nigeria, it was highly successful. In Western Nigeria, it was partially successful. In Eastern Nigeria, it failed woefully. We want to know here the reasons why indirect rule was successful in Northern Nigeria. And we say point number one was centralized system of government. The centralized system of government under the emirs contributed immensely to the success of the system in the North. Point number two, existing system of taxation. A system of taxation was already well established in such a way that when the British came, the collection of taxes and rates for the administration was facilitated. Point number three was religion. The common allegiance of the people in the Hausa Fulani Empire to the Islamic religion provided the united people with common culture and religion which aided British rule. Point number four was illiteracy and low education. Illiteracy was very high in the north, and the few educated elites were easily absorbed into the Emirate administration. As a result, they could not challenge the authority and policies of the British government. Point number five, military threat. Most of the emirs easily accepted indirect rule due to the superior military force which Britain applied to crush local resistance to their advancement and territorial control. Now, we want to know why indirect rule was partially successful in the West. And we say that, number one, limited powers of the Yoruba Obas. Indirect rule was not a complete success in the West due to the limited powers of the Yoruba Obas. They lacked the type of centralized government machinery and absolute powers that enabled their northern counterparts to sustain indirect rule. Point number three, taxation. The imposition of taxes on the people weakened the failure of indirect rule in the West. Taxation was not an established custom in the West, and the people were therefore opposed to it, leading to resistance and riot in some areas, example, Isei and Abiyokota. Point number three, Christianity spread freely in the West, and the new converts openly disobeyed their pagan rulers without hesitation. Some festivals and rituals 
which maintain the power and authority of the rulers were disregarded. Thus, the British had to contend with a divided people. Point number four, education. The West was blessed with a large number of highly educated people who were alienated and disregarded by the colonial masters during the period of indirect rule. This elite criticized the rationale behind the use of illiterate traditional rulers to control government machinery to their own exclusion. This led to the struggle for independence of the country. Point number five, elevating the authority of the Alafi of Oyo. The attempt by Lugard to restore the authority of the Alafi of Oyo over the remaining Yoruba states contributed significantly to the failure of the system in the West. Through wars, states like Ibado and Abiyokota had emerged more powerful politically and militarily than Oyo itself. Thus, British attempts to impose the Alafi of Oyo on the entire Yoruba race met with resistance and undermined the effectiveness of indirect rule in the West. Having seen why indirect rule partially succeeded in the West, we want to know why indirect rule failed woefully in southeastern Nigeria. Number one, absence of traditional rulers. Indirect rule was not practicable because there were no traditional rulers or any centralized authority to be used as intermediaries between the colonial government and the people. Point number two, appointment of Waran chiefs. The appointment of Waran chiefs, which was to facilitate indirect rule in eastern Nigeria, rather to attend it. This was because there were no politically powerful traditional rulers in Igbo land. Point number three, the dispersed system of Igbo society. Igbo land consisted of very small, scattered independent village units. Bringing them together under a common administrative system was thus an uphill task. Point number five, disregard for the educated elites. The British colonial administrators preferred illiterate traditional rulers whom they could use for the administration rather than the educated elites who were very likely to oppose them. Point number five, absence of taxation. Taxation was not known in the East and when the Waran chiefs imposed it on the people, it resulted in riots. The Abba Women's Riot of 1929 was a revolt against the attempt to levy taxes on every adult male without any effective taxation system. However, the British could not generate much fund to run the administration. Point number six was religion. The rapid spread of Christianity among the Igbo further fragmented the society. The Christians disobeyed traditional laws and refused to participate in the festivals and rituals of their various communities. Now, having seen why indirect rule was excellently executed in the North, partially succeeded in the West, and woefully failed in the East, we want to know the merits of indirect rule generally in the administration of Nigeria. Yes, indirect rule had benefits. We want to look at some of the benefits. Number one, why indirect rule benefited or was beneficial to Nigeria or the system is that the system was less expensive because the colonial masters used the machinery of traditional rulers to run the affairs of government. It would have cost the British more in terms of resource to engage their nationals in direct rule. Point number two, the system largely preserved the customs and traditions of the people. It retained the people's languages, culture, and religion. Point number three, or C, the colonies witnessed rapid socioeconomic development since part of the revenue collected from taxes and rates was used in building schools, markets, hospitals, roads, 
bridges, and others. D. The system brought government closer to the people through their traditional rulers. The people were provided the opportunity of participating in the affairs of the government that catered for them in their various localities. E. Indirect rule guaranteed peace and stability for the emirs and chiefs who were used to run the affairs of government in the localities. F. Indirect rule guaranteed peace and stability for the emirs and chiefs who were used to run the affairs in the government in uh, the affairs of government in the localities. G. It was the earliest attempt at introducing a uniform system of local government throughout the country. H. Indirect rule contributed to the training of traditional rulers in the modern art of running the administration of local government. They were given periodic training to enable them to adapt to the latest local government reforms in the country. I. The system modernized traditional institutions like traditional courts, law, and customs. Even though traditional rulers presided over the courts in their localities, the colonial masters presided over the AP courts. J. The spirit of nationalism was developed as a result of the lineation of the educated elite in the administration of indirect rule throughout the country. The elite, being outside the system, criticized and rejected the governmental system, which vested political authority in the largely illiterate traditional rulers. They therefore went ahead to champion the struggle for self-governance. Having seen the merits of indirect rule, we are now going to look at the merits or disadvantages of indirect rule in the system. And we say that one, indirect rule strengthened the policy of divide and rule strategy, putting into opposing camps the traditional rulers and the educated elites. This remained divided throughout the period of the system of government. Likewise, we had the differences between the North, the West, and East exploited to prevent the emergence of a common front against British colonial rule. Point number two, educated members of African societies were excluded from participating in colonial government, governmental activities in preference for the traditional rulers. This hindered early constitutional and economic development of the colonies. Point number three, indirect through failed to provide qualitative leadership to educate Nigerians. So even after independence, Many leaders had no good crafts of what government or their position entailed. This has contributed to the political instability of the country. Point number four, Britain reduced the literate African chiefs, some of whom had absolute powers, to puppet or stooges in the hands of the colonial government. Five, a conflict of responsibility was also created for the rulers who had to be accountable both to their people and to the colonial government, two groups with conflicting demands. In effect, some traditional rulers became alienated from their people. Six, indirect through the late constitutional development and early independence because the conservative chiefs were not prepared to surrender their cherished powers for early independence. Point number seven, the system concentrated powers in the hands of a few traditional rulers who eventually marginalized the vast majority of the people in this regard of their customs and tradition. The appointment of Waran chiefs in the Eastern region created political, social, and economic crisis, which resulted in the failure of the system. Point number eight, the system deprived the people of some sections of the country of the advantages of checks and balances on their leaders, which had existed in the traditional political institutions. 
Point number nine, the system denied traditional rulers the much needed freedom they required for themselves and for the defense of the collective interest of their subjects. They were treated just like employees of the colonial government and required to implement colonial policies and programs without resistance. Lastly, and point number 10, as a result of the great powers enjoyed by incumbents, the post of traditional rulers became highly contentious and succession disputes increased. Before we end today's lecture, we've seen the administration of British colonial government in Nigeria. We will look at briefly some of the benefits colonial administration gave Nigeria. For instance, in most Nigerian states, urbanization erupted. So many villages became township. The health system increased. So many schools were established, missionary and government schools. Communication became easy. So many roads were created that made movement very easy. Importantly, system of money or monetary system, British monetary system was introduced. There was no longer trade by butter with the emergence of colonialism. These are some of the benefits. As we have mentioned the benefits of colonialism, it does not mean that there were not serious disadvantages. Next week, when we trade chapter 13, titled Nationalism and Formation of Political Parties in Nigeria, we shall look at the factors that led to nationalism and development of political parties in Nigeria. Thank you.